Our guest tonight was signed by the Atlanta Braves in 1987 as an amateur free agent. He made his major league debut on September 18, 1992 against the Houston Astros. After sharing catching duties with Charlie O'Brien and Eddie Perez for four seasons, he established himself as the Braves' regular catcher in 1996. That same season, he led the Braves to win the National League Championship Series, earning the series' most valuable player honors. He had his best season in 2003 with a 328 batting average, 43 home runs, and 109 RBIs in 129 games games, including a 378 on on-base percentage and a 687 slugging percentage. In that season, he broke Todd Hundley's record for most home runs hit in a season by a catcher, 41, and was selected to the All-Star Game, winning the Silver Slugger Award and finishing fifth in the National League MVP ballot. While with the Braves, he also caught Kent Merker's no-hitter on April 8, 1994. He joins us tonight to talk about his wonderful new book, Behind the Plate, A Catcher's View of the Braves' Dynasty. And as a Mets fan here in New York, while it's painful to talk about the Braves dynasty, it's still a pleasure to welcome Javi Lopez to WLIE Sports Talk New York. Welcome, Javi. Well, thank you, Mark, for having me. Our pleasure. While we mentioned this is a New York-centric show, we kind of had the attitude here in New York that it's the end-all and be-all, the mecca of sports. You walk into any bookstore in the country today, and you'll see so many books about the Yankees, the Mets, the Red Sox. But you look at the Bobby Cox era, and you'd be hard-pressed to find a better period in any club's history. And aside from your new book, there aren't many Braves books out there. So I guess this is a two-part question for you. Number one, why is it that there's not that many books about that Braves era, and what made you decide to write a book? Well, about why there's not many books about the Braves, uh, I cannot answer that question. Uh, I'm pretty surprised by you saying that. Uh, I know about Bobby Cox having a few books out. I know Small just has his book out. Otis Nixon has his book out. Um, other than that, I don't know. Matt Glavin has his book out. Other than that, I don't know why, <laughs> to be honest with you. You're right. I mean, there's, there's a lot to talk about the Braves. We have a 14-year a uh, run uh, going into the playoffs in the World Series. And uh, even though we only got one World Series, we still, you know, make it into the playoffs for 14 years in a row, which is – that can be harder than just winning a World Series. It's, it's, it's a lot harder winning – you know, winning 162 games than uh, than a series of seven games. But yeah, you're right. I, I, I don't know why there's no more, you know, by books and, and biographies out there about the Braves. What makes me what makes me decide to to write a book was uh, well, friends, uh, fan, and uh, my own family. They keep pushing me uh, to to write, you know, my my own autobiography. Uh, people are wondering about. What it's like to be Javi Lopez in the minor leagues or growing up in Puerto Rico, and people actually convinced me. It's interesting, too, because being a Met fan, to read about that period in the Braves' history, it's somewhat painful. But I have to say, as a Met fan, I totally enjoyed this book. It's a great read, and you start the book out with these words Anyone who plays professional baseball plays for the love of the game, as well as for the money and the perks that go with it. But it's essentially you're talking about the love for the game. If you had to pick one element that you love most about the game of baseball, what would it be? Uh, I would, I mean, just the game itself. I mean, once you start playing baseball as a little kid, it's just in your blood, just like anything else. It's in your blood, and uh, you, you're always looking forward for the next game. You're always looking forward to, uh, to uh, you know, be in action, uh, go at bat facing a new pitcher every day, uh, that's something that is in your blood. I mean, if you don't like baseball, with the type of work that we have every single day, day in, day out, flying, flying, flying out, you know, it, you won't be able to be a baseball player. I mean, it's it, even though it's a game, it's a hard work in order to stay, you know, in the major league. And you also continue in that first chapter about goal setting and getting your name in the record book and leaving your mark after you retire. Can you tell the audience a little bit more about that and what were some of your personal goals that you had set? Well, obviously, uh, being playing for 14 years in the big league, I always want to leave a mark. And, you know, I always, I never uh, satisfy with the way I play. I always want to do more and better. I want to be better and better and better. Uh, obviously, my goal was, you know, someday to win a gold glove, someday to win a batting title, someday to win a home run, uh, uh, you know, uh, home run leader. Uh, maybe, you know, get to a thousand RBI, get to three thousand, you know, stuff like that. Always, you, 
every player has to have a goal in mind in order to pursue it. And that's what makes you motivate to work even harder and always looking forward to to get better in the game uh, by, by putting yourself some goal in mind. And uh, one of the main goals that I always wanted to uh, earn was a, a gold glove. Unfortunately, I was close a couple of times, but uh, never were able to, to obtain that, you know, that award. Batting average was another one. Uh, I, know, I knew it was really hard, but, you know, I'm playing baseball just like anybody else. You know, as long as I have a bat in my hand, I – know how to change and you look at back at you know your career and you realize that you hold the record for most home runs by a catcher you know you take a look at the greats that have played this game what does that that particular record mean to you well definitely it was very important for me uh since uh i knew the winning that gold glove later in my career was kind of a uh, you know far away be able to you know i don't know be able to obtain that three thousand hit or hit you know 400, 300, 400 home runs is kind of far away. Well, at least, you know, once I start the season, well, half the way throughout the season, that's when I start realizing, well, I, I, I'm going for a record book right here. <laughs> and uh, this is it, my only chance because uh, I'm playing, like, later in my career. And uh, if I don't do this right now, you know, it'll be even harder from now on to, to try to get, you know, even closer. Back in September 2003, when I had like 38 home run or something like that, and I still got a whole month to go uh, before the season was over, I was like, "But well, this is it. I mean, I'm going for it. Um, that's why it was hard for me to hit home runs at the end of the year because <laughs> every at bat I was looking to hit one, try to break the record. And uh, But slowly I was able to do it. Uh, as a matter of fact, those are bad that I hit the home runs. The bad that I wasn't thinking about it. <laughs> and, you know, one by one, I was able to reach the... Um, I actually hit 43 that year, but 42 was for the record. Um, Hundley had 41 home run, and I was able to hit 42. As a catcher, I hit another one, 43, but I was as a, I came as a, that came as a pinch hitter. So right. that doesn't count. Right. Now, the book also touches on your childhood in Puerto Rico, as well as your family, which many people probably don't realize this. It includes a two-time Olympian, a former brother-in-law who hit over 400 home runs in the major leagues, a current brother-in-law who was ranked by Sports Illustrated as one of the world's top athletes in 1979. So could you tell us a little bit about your family and what growing up in Ponce was like? Well, my sister's husband, his name is Cheyenne Vasayo. He was uh, an, Olympian, an Olympian swimmer. Uh, Back in the uh, 70s and 80s, uh, he he actually went. He competed for the United States, even though he you know he was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Um, he he went to uh, University of Miami and compete for you know for his school for his college and become you know an Olympian for the U.S. and he won a gold medal in uh, in Moscow, the, the Olympics in Moscow, and I believe he won a gold medal in Los Angeles. We were lucky to have it in our family. He's been a very well-known guy in, in Puerto Rico and, you know, in the swimming uh, community. Um, he actually has his own um, swimming academy in Boca Raton, Florida. And um, my other sister used to be married Juan Gonzalez. wasn't for long, but <laughs> <laughs> it was official that they were married for, <laughs> for a period of time. Right. Um, and unfortunately, that didn't work out. And she also was an Olympic volleyball player as well, right? Yes. She also played for the Puerto Rican national team uh, volleyball. And uh, she also played volleyball for Puerto Rico. And she competed in uh, Olympics in Seoul, Korea, in, Bar- in Barcelona. And she competed in different uh, Pan American games, quite a few. And, uh, yeah, she's been, she, he, she played volleyball for 22 years. Now, this portion of the book really made me feel old because uh, you give credit to Jose Cruz, and I remember you know, watching Jose Cruz as a rookie. Um, you remember finally a clinic you attended, but more importantly, uh, advice he gave you directly. And to me, it's, it's one of those wonderful stories, and perhaps given the state of baseball today, I don't know if something like this could happen. Um, could you tell our listeners a little bit more about that day when you were with your dad in Arroyo and the advice one of the best Houston Astros of all time gave you? 
Well, he was uh, <clears throat> the first time I saw him was in uh, in Ponce, where I'm from. He was doing a clinic with him with his brothers. He got two brothers, Cirilo and Hector, and uh, he was doing clinic that day. Um, basically, he was teaching us how to, you know, uh, feel. Cause they were playing the outfield. He was teaching how to do, the, you know, feeling in the outfield and hitting. And obviously, he was giving an advice about, you know, what kind of attitude you, you need to have in order to become a um, major league player, which is, you know, have a lot of dedication, uh, respect, uh, always listen, um, and all that, you know, kind of, you know, stuck in my head and um, never let that go. I always remember that. Um, that's exactly what I did, you know, when I signed professional baseball. I always, you know, respect everybody and uh, always listen and uh, just do what they say, you know, just by having a good attitude like that, coaches like that, you know, and um, teams like that. And that gets you, uh, you know, a good reputation, which is what, you know, uh, teams like on players. Not necessarily the ability to play baseball, but, they also look at the attitude. Talking about attitude, one of the turning points in your career was an emotional breakdown you actually had while struggling in the minors. You talk about it in detail, uh, the stress your dad would put on you, constantly asking you why you keep swinging at bad pitchers. You talk about some of the obstacles you met within the minors, the language barrier, as well how important Grady Little was, uh, your manager at the time. What were some of the things you remember most about your years in the minors? Well, that breakdown was when I was in, uh, in playing for the Durham Bulls. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't hitting uh, the way I, I knew I can, you know, I'm capable to hit. And I couldn't figure out what was going on with me. Um, the good thing about Grady was that he's giving me the confidence, always believing in me. And thank God he did that because otherwise, who knows, I would have been released probably when I was in, in, <laughs> in single A. But uh, he always believed in me, and, and I always struggled. And I knew he believed in me, and that's why it was so frustrating for me to not, you know, be able to hit the way, you know, he would love me to. Um, I struggled at the end, and, uh, you know, I uh, meditate, I think a lot, uh, I I try to calm down myself and, you know, think and calm down because uh, the frustration can get you, you know, into a deeper, deeper hole. You know, and uh, I was trying to, you know, stop that from happening. And uh, the following year, I just, you know, completely fresh, go to spin training. And uh, unfortunately, the, the, the following year, I had the best year of my career in, in the minor leagues. I was the MVP of the Southern League in AA. We, I ended up winning the, the, the batting title. And uh, at the end of the season, I got called up to the big leagues. You mentioned being called up to the big leagues. Over the course of the last four years, we've had the opportunity to speak to many you know, former major leaguers about their major league debut. And I really don't recall anyone having the same type of experience as you did because your major league debut also marked the first time that you ever set foot in a major league stadium. Could you, uh, right. could you tell our audience a little bit about how that whole experience was for you? Well, <laughs> It is, um, how can I explain this? <laughs> it is, um, it was amazing. Uh, been playing in so many minor leagues, uh, baseball field, never ever been into a major league ballpark. And, um, and when I got called up the first time, it was the first time I, you know, stepping into a major league baseball stadium. I mean, I was, I mean, once the taxi was driving by the stadium, I was already amazed how big the stadium was, how many people that were already out there waiting to get in. It was unbelievable. I'm like, wow. I mean, now I know what this is called the big league. You know, this is this big. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, it, it was amazing. It was, I guess it was worth for me. I guess it was good, the fact that I'd never been into a major league ballpark before I actually, you know, got called up because I didn't know what to expect. I know seeing on TV is not the same as – if you are there. And um, my first impression was, you know, indescribable. And do you remember the feeling walking to the plate for the first time? I was very intimidated walking into the dugout and uh, and be able to see all these guys, uh, Justice, Freddie McGriff, and, you know, Gladys Small. I'm like, wow, <laughs> <laughs> am I really here? 
and everybody really welcomed me in and congratulated.